Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Sonny Yakaru. Hey, Sonny. How's it feel to be back in the U.S. after DEF CON? Uh, pretty good. Uh, my, my trip was cut sh- a little bit short in Japan due to the typhoon. I decided to jump out of there as fast as possible. But yeah. Yeah, you made it in the nick of time, I think, right? Like your plane was, I could just, I was imagining you like flying out and like the plane, like flying out and just like the hurricane, like coming up behind it as you just like flew out into the clouds, like in the movies (laughs) (laughs) or the typhoon rather. Yeah, I know a bunch of people who left a few hours, even a few hours after me, they were, their their planes were grounded and they had to make it through. Luckily, Osaka wasn't uh, the, the brunt of the damage. It was mostly more towards Tokyo, but yeah. Still quite a bit of like rain and wind and stuff. Would have put a damper on any vacation. Yeah. So how was DevCon? DevCon was pretty good. It was a bit like weird in a little bit. It felt very unlike other past DevCons in a lot of ways. Keep in mind, I've only been to one DevCon before, which was DevCon 3 in Mexico City. But it was cool. I mean, I think there was a lot of talk about ETH 2.0 and whatnot. I would say my overwhelming thing I would just say is it felt less like a DevCon and more like Osaka Blockchain Week. Yeah. In the sense that it wasn't very Ethereum. It didn't have the same Ethereum focus as it normally does. Like when you walk into the main venue, there's no, where's the rainbows and unicorns gone? And where, where's the ETH logos? And where's the, all the main stage talks or like non-Ethereum stuff and whatnot? Why do you think that is? I think there's this interesting question of what is the ethereum community is it the core ethereum technology that specific chain or is it this community of people who are interested in decentralized applications and web3 and defi and whatnot and so if it's the latter does that mean that other layer one platforms that are also trying to push forward that same movement are also part of the ethereum community or not and i think that was kind of the general debate where it seems the ethereum foundation seems to think that those are um, and then a lot of the or portions of the eth community uh tend to think that are not and so i think that's kind of where some of the debate comes in i mean i wasn't there but i've, I've heard a lot of similar things from people who were I heard on another podcast someone say that increasingly, you know, other projects that are trying to launch their own layer one solutions in order to grow communities need the kind of buy in from the Ethereum community. And that being at this conference and presenting their ideas there and sort of like showing good faith and sort of pat blanche, uh, I don't know if you can say that in English is a way to to gain credibility in order to launch uh, a, a, like new layer one solutions. Yeah, I mean, th- 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 exactly. And I think that's kind of w- a little bit of what I meant as well, where it's like, you know, there is this DAP community and they're all currently mostly in Ethereum. And most of the, it, it's going to be very difficult for like new L1s who are trying to solve a similar problem to Ethereum, but maybe using different technology or different consensus protocol or different staking mechanism or whatever. But if they're still solving the same problem of being an L1 smart contracting system, if all the smart contract developers are working on Ethereum already, the only way to get get them is to poach them if you want to be cynical or attract them if you're, you know, want to be more lenient, generous. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It would be interesting to see how these ecosystems grow and, and what synergies will exist between them in the future you know for the ones that will remain because i presume a lot of a lot of these other layer one solutions that are being proposed you know, might find their own niche applications or might even you know just disappear in a couple of years luckily for cosmos what's nice is i we're able to make a pitch more not just on technological changes but there are, i think are some deeper ideological and like structural differences between cosmos and ethereum which is why i think there's a little bit less of a i think it's a little bit more complementary than uh like much more positive some than you know cosmos we don't really believe in like or we're not focused on uh layer one like true and complete smart contracting systems for example and so right no i kind of get that complementary aspect as well i, I feel that 
Ethereum and Cosmos are more complementary than, say, other platforms. Cool. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. And um, I'm going to see you soon because we're going to be at SF Blockchain Week, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But first, I want to introduce our guest for today. Uh, our guest is Eli Ben Sasson, who's the co-founder and chief scientist in the East at Starkware. Yeah, so Starkware has actually two chief scientists, one in the East and one in the West, which is crazy. And it just goes to show <laughs> the amount of uh, the amount of crazy research that's going on in that com- in that company. So prior to founding Starkware, Ellie was a professor at Technion, uh, the Israeli Institute of Technology, and he held positions at MIT, Harvard, Princeton. And his research focuses on theoretical computer science and proofs uh, and computations. And he's particularly interested in how you can apply these proof systems to applications and decentralized applications and cryptocurrencies. So if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, you'll remember Brian and Mayer's interview with Ellie in 2016. This was long before there was even an idea for Starkware. In fact, it would be another two years before the release of the Starks paper, which Ellie co-founded. And he was also the co-founder of this you know, little cryptocurrency, privacy preserving cryptocurrency called Zcash, uh, which we've also talked about a lot on the podcast. So I, I really enjoyed this conversation because it, it was we, we sort of broke down the types of zero knowledge schemes which exist today, explaining the differences between Starks and Snarks and bulletproofs and all of these terms that we've been hearing more and more lately. And generally, I thought it was a really good refresher on on zero knowledge proofs. I mean, I know you spent a lot of time researching these things, but for me, it was a good way to sort of get up to date on where, what the state of all these things are at. And in, in a moment where, as he describes it, there's sort of a Cambrian explosion in the zero knowledge space, it's a useful conversation to to have to have a better idea of like where we're coming from, where things are at, and where we're going. What did you think of the conversation with Ellie? I think that, especially in the last few months, this whole Cambrian explosion thing has been, you know, I I, I tried a little my best to like keep up with what was going on in zero knowledge a little bit. Uh, I'm you know I'm not the best cryptography expert, but you know, I, I would try to keep in at least keep in my head of like, okay, these are the trade-offs between these different types of zero knowledge implementations. Like, okay, this is how snarks compared to bulletproofs to Starks. But now in the last few months, it's like, oh man, there's Sonic and Supersonic and Plonk and this and that and that. And I, I've just even stopped keeping track at this point. And so it's good that there are some very smart people uh who are focused on like, you know, mapping all of this stuff out and like pushing that field forward. And it's really cool that, you know, this is a company that isn't really focused on, they don't have a chain or a project. Like, you know, they have some projects that they've worked on, but they're really more of sample projects to show off a technology. And it's really a sort of a company, it's really more of a research team that's been structured as a company. And so that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I like their approach. And I'm I'm curious to see what will come out of it. Like, what are these products that, that will be released. I know that they're working on one product to help scale um, exchanges. And so we talked about uh, this Stark Dex, which they've built, which is really sort of a proof of concept to demonstrate uh, the abilities of these future products. But, you know, yeah, this, this will be a B2B company servicing companies in the crypto space and not so much servicing sort of like crypto users, at least for now, that seems to be the direction. And yeah, you mentioned all, all these other projects. Yeah, I mean, that's also an interesting aspect of what's going on at the moment. There's just so many things going on. And you know, we're, we're looking at having a lot of those uh, folks on the podcast as well. I think we'll probably get to meet a lot of them at, at, in SF. So yeah, before we get into the interview, let's talk about SF Blockchain Week. It's coming fast. There's lots going on. And uh, so let's break it down. And don't fast forward this one because I'm going to tell you how you can get free tickets to the main event conference. So first and foremost... Uh, if you're going to SF, you know, if you want to meet with me and Sonny, we're going to be having a casual drinks meetup on the evening of the 29th. It'll be after day two of CESC. So we'll have it in Berkeley, close to the venue. Uh, I know that we've got a pretty big audience in SF. So I hope to see many of you Bay Area listeners uh, come and hang out with us. Drinks are on us. And you can register at epicenter.rocks slash SF meetup. I'll be, and I think you too, Sunny, will be at CESC on the 28th and 29th. And then the main event, SF Blockchain Week Epicenter on the 31st and 1st. I'm super excited to be emceeing uh, the Epicenter Conference, which is quite fitting because they have the same name as this podcast. Uh, they're organized by Decrypt Capital. And Sunny, you're also going to be speaking uh, at this conference. 
Yeah, I'll be uh, moderating some panels and uh, I'll be speaking at the uh, CESC event, which CESC, by the way, is also, it's being organized primarily by Blockchain at Berkeley, which is an organization I co-founded a couple of years ago. Cool. And you're, you're also putting on uh, an event. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So I'm kind of also helping put on another two events, actually. But one of them is this uh, macro.wtf event. So basically, uh, back in Osaka, the day before DevCon, there was this awesome event called DeFi.WTF. And it was just like a one day conference uh, where they invited a bunch of DeFi speakers. And it, it was just a really good conference. Like all the speakers were really great. The the vibes were really good. They had this like cool aesthetic, which I, don't know, I, I really like. And so yeah, it was a really good event. And so after the event, I was hanging out with them and I was just telling, we were chatting about, you know, I want to see more. Well, one, I was like, okay, we should turn this like dot WTF thing into like into a thing. Like let's like let's do another event. And I've been reading a lot mostly on macroeconomics lately. And so I want to do something where we put crypto in the context of macroeconomics. And so that's what we're doing on the Wednesday of SF Blockchain Week. So the day between CESC and Epicenter, we'll have a uh, our our own little event and on the thirtieth. Yes. And if anyone's interested in speaking, we're, we're still actively looking for speakers. And so uh, just feel free to message me on Twitter or on Telegram. Uh, my handle is SunnyA97 on both of those. So that's uh, macro.wtf for more details. So yeah, so tickets are still available for CSC and, and the Epicenter Conference. So if you want to get tickets, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash tickets and enter the code epicenter2x for 20% off. And... Here's how you can get free tickets. So they've got a deal with eToro, which were our guests last week. Uh, Yanni Asia was on the podcast. And so if you create an account with eToro and deposit $50, you'll get a free ticket to the Epicenter Conference. I mean, that's a pretty good deal, right? Like 50 bucks deposit on eToro. You, you know. So to get in on this deal, you just need to go to sfblockchainweek.io slash eToro and the details are there. I think you need to do it before the 28th, which is fitting because that's when the conference starts. Then we're also going to the DeFi hackathon over the weekend. Uh, Sunny, tell us about this hackathon and why people should be excited about it. Yeah, so Cosmos is one of the uh, lead sponsors of the uh, of the hackathon. But you know, so I'm I'm really excited to kind of show off some of the stuff that we've been working on on Cosmos and why it's a really cool uh, platform for building cool DeFi applications. Uh, some of which I've been working on uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, you don't have to build on Cosmos for the hackathon. You can build on anything you want. And it'll be really interesting just to see a hackathon that's really focused on DeFi products. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a $50,000 prize pool in Atoms for winning teams. So that's a that's a good reason to attend. You know, it's going to be super DeFi focused. So, I mean, you could, you could build like a lending platform. You could build like a stable coin on Cosmos, for example. And... I think IBC, yeah, IBC will be ready by then. So you can also interoperate with the existing Cosmos ecosystem so that there's all sorts of possibilities here that opens up. Yeah, that's one of the most exciting things. It'll be the first time IBC is kind of ready for people to play with. And so a lot of people are going to be coming in and like, uh, I know, for example, Kava is for their project, they're working on uh, an, I, an IBC de- uh, demo of like moving atoms and stuff onto the Kava test that and collateralizing them to create stable coins. So, yeah. That's super cool. I'm like really excited about that. To register for the DeFi Hackathon, which is organized in part by Cosmos, our sponsor, go to epicenter.rocks slash sfcosmos and be sure to let them know that you heard about it on Epicenter. I'd also like to tell you about our other sponsors for today's episode. So recently I started reading The Bitcoin Standard by the economist Safety Amos. And he spends a considerable amount of time at the beginning of the book talking about the history of metals as money. And throughout the years, throughout the centuries, copper, silver, and gold have been used as money. But what has remained consistent is gold's position as the most stable and trusted source of stability as money. And to some extent, that remains true today. In fact, as he describes it, central banks are still buying and stockpiling gold in great amounts. So if you're holding crypto and you'd like to buy gold, there's no better way to do that than at Voltoro.com. 
Voltoro is a leading gold to crypto exchange, and they've just released their brand new V2 platform, which looks and feels great. You can create your account in just a few minutes, and once you're verified, you can transfer Bitcoin or Dash onto your Voltoro account and start trading gold. What I love the most about Voltoro is that you're not buying some gold derivative or some asset which is backed by gold. You're buying real hard gold, man. It is protected by Brinks, stashed in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains. And if you'd like, I mean, you'd have to be a little crazy, but you can have that gold delivered to you. At Epicenter, we've been friends and customers of Voltoro for many years. We've held a portion of our crypto assets in gold, and we've always been happy to have that stability whenever the markets were really volatile. So to start trading, go to Voltoro.com and create your account. And when you do, do me a favor. On the bottom right of the website, there's a little yellow support icon. Click on it, and in the message box, just say, I heard about you on Epicenter. That would make me really happy. We'd like to thank Voltoro for the support of the podcast. I'm also really excited to tell you about our new sponsor this week, and that is B9 Lab. And if you don't know about B9 Lab, they are the premier blockchain developer academy on the market. I've been following them for many years. In fact, their co-founder, Elias Hassa, is at about every blockchain conference in Europe. So we've bumped into each other many times over the years. And it's been great to see this company grow from a small team and just a handful of courses to now over 15 people with professional instructors and a breadth of courses that spans just about every blockchain protocol on the market. So they have Ethereum developer courses, courses for Corda and Hyperledger Sawtooth and Fabric, and they're adding new courses all the time. And one of those courses that they're adding is the brand new Certified Solidity and Smart Contract Auditor course. It's an eight-week program, it's a part-time course, and it's for experienced Ethereum developers who want to expand their skill set and become smart contract auditors. This course will introduce you to the current state of the smart contract security ecosystem, and you'll learn through exercises which pull from vulnerabilities that were found in the wild, and it provides advice for those who are looking to enter this market. So if you're an Ethereum developer, just think about what an eight-week smart contract auditing course could mean for your hourly rate or the salary that you can ask for in an interview. I mean, chances are you can ask for much more if you have this skill set. So B9 Lab have partnered with Solidified, a smart contract auditing platform, and they're offering three paid internships at the end of this course and the possibility to join their auditor pool. The course starts on November 18th, and there are only 100 seats available. So if you're interested in this course, register quickly because these seats are going to go fast. To sign up, go to solidified.b9lab.com. The link will be in the show notes. And use the code EPICENTER at checkout to get 5% off the course price. And this code is valid on all the courses on b9lab.com, so you can get that 5% discount on anything that you see there that you find interesting. We'd like to thank B9 Lab, the blockchain education specialist, for their support of Epicenter. So with that, here is our interview with Ellie Bensasson. We're here with Ellie Bensasson, who is a return guest on the podcast. He's been here before. It was almost four years ago, and uh, Ellie has been gracious enough to give us some of his time while he's on vacation, and it's very late at night uh, where he is in Israel. Ellie, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks, uh, Sebastian and Sunny. Always a pleasure to be on this show. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. And uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, I was looking before we start recording. Last time you were on was in 2016. This was long before I think there was even an idea to do uh, something like Starkware. Back then, you were a professor at Technion. You know, talk about your trajectory since then. What's it been like to go from the academic life to... Uh, full-on startup mode? A lot of fun <laughs> in one line. Yeah, the trajectory, I think, uh, started years earlier. And um, my Eureka moment was in 2013, May 2013, in the um, Bitcoin conference in San Jose, where it sort of uh, dawned on me that the research I was doing about um, scalable proof systems that, that can be that that stuff can be very useful for blockchains. And that was my turning point. And then 
2016, I was still doing research as a professor, um, you know, advancing the, the science and technology of a very particular brand of proof systems that I think we'll talk about later. Then I believe it was at the end of uh, 2017 that, that sort of uh, we realized that, that it might be time to try and uh, commercialize this stuff. This was uh, right after we were ready to publish um, work on the ZK Starks that we'll talk about later on. And uh, we started this uh, company almost two years ago. So it was around uh, the end of uh, 2017. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun since then. Um, very exciting. Before uh, working on Starkware, you were also one of the co-founders of Zcash, right? Yes. Was Zcash already going on when, we, when, when you were on last time? Or was that something that you got started with afterwards? I was definitely involved in Zcash in 2016. I think the coin launched at the end of 2016. So I guess around the same time I was doing the interview with you, but I was definitely involved with Zcash then because the company has been working, I mean, was working on it for a while since then. Yeah, so back then I was also involved uh, in Zcash, which is also a very exciting uh, project that, that I'm very proud of, uh, you know, having contributed to along with my other uh, founding scientists on that thing. But uh, yeah, since then, we, we sort of moved on to other technologies and other uh, endeavors. And so with one of your other uh, co-founders uh, at Zcash, with uh, Alessandro Chiesa, now you guys are both uh, chief scientists at Starkware. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of how you guys decided to, how Starkware came into being? Yeah, so um, I guess for me, the origins go a very long way back to the days I started my postdoc in 2001 at MIT, and I was doing research with uh, Madhu Sudan, one of the uh, leading figures in the development of the PCP theorem. And it was this trajectory of, of uh, you know, reducing, both making systems a bit more efficient, but also reducing stuff more and more towards practice. And this is something that um, was uh, our passion for a very long time. So, so again, this for me, it started maybe in 2001. I started collaborating with uh, Alessandro Chiesa in around 2010. Shortly after, Michael Ryabtsev, our third co-founder, also uh, started working with us and advancing uh, this, uh, both the science and the technology of this thing. And uh, Uri Kolodny, uh, our CEO and, and fourth co-founder, so he's been a close uh, friend of mine for more than 30 years and also almost as many years was was my business mentor and he certainly was following everything and helping uh, us out with already zcash and other things so at some point uh, when it was clear that this particular technology can can benefit from a dedicated company so uh, you know the four of us sort of joined team uh, joined forces and uh that's how it started uh, towards the end of 2017, which is about two years ago. Cool. We met a couple of weeks ago in uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, Starkware organized this fantastic conference, which was called Starkware Sessions. We've mentioned it a few times on the podcast since then. And during your keynote uh, talk, you gave you you gave this description of the zero knowledge space as going through a Cambrian explosion. Describe what you meant there and talk about the unique time in which we live with regards to how ZKPs are evolving. So this notion of the Cambrian explosion, there was this era about half a billion years ago uh, where from this primordial soup of uh, microbes or things like that, all of a sudden in a very short span of time, a lot of uh, the more advanced creatures that, that we see today you know various plants and, and insects and other forms of life also you know spawned off in a very short time and with uh, cryptographic proof systems uh, commonly referred to as uh, zkps although not not all of them are formally uh, zero knowledge proof systems there's a big family of them um, so these proof systems They've been researched in theory since uh, 1985, since this uh, beautiful uh, uh, 
uh, discovery by uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakov of interactive proofs. And they've been pretty much confined mostly to theoretical works. And then around sort of uh, starting in 2005 to 2010, suddenly we see this emergence of uh, more practical stuff. And over the past uh, a decade, there's been a proliferation of uh, different forms of, of proof systems uh, based on all kinds of different assumptions. And it seems that the speed of uh, release of new kinds of proof systems is sort of increasing almost uh, exponentially or very rapidly. And uh, just over the like, past three or four months, we've, we've heard about uh, Plonk and Sonic and Supersonic and, and Dark and Fractal and Marlin, and you know, by the time we'll end this interview, maybe a couple more will be released. So it's really uh, quite uh, remarkable. And where do you think this is all heading? You know, if, if we're now in the Cambrian explosion, and, and you, you sort of equate that to the, the real Cambrian explosion that happened in, in, with regards to life, you know, where can this all lead us, knowing that there's just so much more ahead to discover? Hard to say. Okay, one thing I think is for sure that we'll see uh, a lot of systems deployed and and you know integrated into products. Uh, that's one thing I think Starkware is leading with in, in you know this particular adoption of a, a particular form of uh, proof systems and bringing them into live products that that will help scaling. Um, so we'll see a, a prol proliferation not just of uh, academic research but also of uh, dedicated productization and. Uh, you know, robust code bases that will be used. I think at the same time, we'll also see a better understanding of the different building blocks uh, by which you can compose and build different uh, proof systems. We're already seeing this. So this will continue. And, you know, at some point we'll, we'll come to some uh, decent understanding. And the most exciting stuff is that often with, with research, you know, some, some completely unexpected new discoveries or challenges or open problems might be uh, discovered, but, but that, you know, one cannot predict what they will look like. That's maybe, as a scientist, the most exciting aspect to me. Do you think it's a matter of, like, we're going to be finding the perfect proof system that, like, kind of satisfies most of the use cases? Or are we going to get into an ecosystem where we have, like, many different proof systems, each of that are, maybe are good for specific use cases? I think that when the dust settles, there'll probably be a very small number of proof systems that are actually used at scale because, uh, you know, they're built on different uh, principles and mixing them is not as efficient as sticking with one or two of them. And uh, I'm biased, of course, but, uh, you know, my bet is on uh, Starks for reasons that I can describe later. So that's what I, it's just a little bit like, uh, you know, if you look at other kinds of infrastructures for, uh, in, in the computer science world, so there's an abundance of communication protocols or ways to build operating systems or programming languages. But uh, at the end of the day, there is a very small number of them that actually stick around and are used by everyone. So I think it will be a little bit like, like that. Maybe not one, but, but uh, I think there'll be a small number. So not all the, this cool research will be necessarily adopted as, as infrastructure by all systems. So how would you say like we should go about like thinking about the trade-offs and comparisons between uh, different proof systems? What are some of the parameters we should be looking at? Like the ones that come to uh, that I'm aware of are things like prover time, verification time, and uh, proof size. What are some other things that uh, we should be looking at? Yeah, so definitely uh, prover, verifier, and, and proof size. I would say that, uh, especially if you look at scaling, it's far more important to look also at the amortized costs, which means, you know, for, for a certain batch, you take, uh, let's say, prover time, and, and you divide it by, by the number of uh, uh, statements or transactions that, that this proof covers. And the same thing with verification time or gas cost, uh, same thing with uh, proof length. That's far more important uh, in terms of uh, scaling. One other set of parameters that, that was, I think, a bit overlooked, and, and uh, we were very uh, 
uh, interested in is the cryptographic assumptions on which you're building these systems. And a way to think of it is, is in terms of uh, future-proofing your systems. So the more your assumptions are sort of fundamental, have been around for a while, and the more other stuff is, is built on them, it sort of uh, implies that they're a little bit more uh, future-proof than more exotic uh, assumptions that have been around for a shorter amount of time and scrutinized by fewer uh, peers. Uh, so that's another dimension that, that was slightly overlooked in evaluating these systems. So I think this is a good segue into the world of Starks. And before we dive deep into Starks, I think it'd be helpful to get a brief refresh on zero-knowledge proofs so that just everyone's on the same page. Can you summarize very succinctly, like what is a zero-knowledge proof? So a zero-knowledge proof, uh, there's a mathematical definition, and it is one that covers privacy. Basically, informally, a zero-knowledge proof is, is a proof. Uh, think of it as some, some sort of beefed up uh, grocery receipt that uh, when you look at it, you're completely certain that the, uh, let's say, the total sum that you need to pay is correct, but you learn nothing other than this fact. So it's a privacy-preserving technique, a magical one at that. Uh, the term ZKP, by the way, by now has been sort of borrowed to cover a much larger range of uh, proof systems that, that I like to refer to as either cryptographic proofs in general or sometimes as proofs of computational integrity. And both of these terms are terms that are not mathematically and formally defined. So you could sort of loosely use them to define a very large range of proof systems, including ones that, that mostly care about scalability and not privacy. So you have this sort of receipt that tells you uh, that a very large computation or a very large batch of transactions has been processed correctly without um, needing to pay the cost of, of checking each and every one of these transactions. So this larger domain of cryptographic proofs or proofs of computational in integrity there's a variety of technologies that, that allow you to scale systems up and assert their correctness and computational integrity, and also to do so in a privacy-preserving manner. Okay, thanks. That's, uh, that's a very clear uh, explanation. And so what are Starks and how do they fit in this broader context? So within the variety of proof systems out there, a proof system that satisfies basically two important parameters will be called a Stark. And these important parameters are one, that it is uh, scalable, which means that as the number of transactions you're processing goes to infinity, proving time scales with it nearly linearly. So it's almost the same cost to just compute the stuff as it is to generate a proof for it. And at the same time, verifying a proof uh, scales exponentially smaller than the amount of computation. So a system that is scalable, that's the S in a Stark, and also transparent, which means that there is no trusted setup and, and all the, the only ingredient that you need in order to make the system uh, uh, secure is, is public source of randomness, or you need to assume that the universe has some entropy in it. So systems that are scalable and transparent are called Starks, and um, there's a, a very natural way of constructing such uh, Starks that, that uh, leads to systems that are also post-quantum secure and have very efficient prover and verifier in uh, concrete terms. So I, I knew that the uh, T in Stark meant uh, the transparent, but I actually didn't know I th that the S stands for scalable because in Snarks, the S stands for succinct. And so can you explain like what's the reasoning behind that difference there? Does do Starks not have this like succinctness property that's present in Snarks? Yeah, well the the mathematical definition of succinct in in a Snark is one that sort of uh involves a security parameter and talks about a constant size proof that is uh constant uh but uh, sort of allowed to be polynomial in this security parameter. So sort of, I mean, I don't want to get bogged into very technical details. One could say that the term succinct 
refers only, only to one part of scalability, which is you want the verifier to be very efficient. But that's not, not enough for scalability. You need something more, and that is that you need the proving time to scale really well. And the reason this is important is because we know of theoretical constructions, for instance, the PCP theorem, where you can get amazingly succinct verification time, but at a horrendous uh, cost to proving time. So succinctness is not enough for scalability. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You also need this other aspect, which is uh, super efficient proving time. So when we coined the definition of a Stark, we wanted to make sure that we're also capturing that aspect as well, which is why uh, we, we think it's better to use scalability as this sort of uh, two-pronged definition, both efficient proving time and efficient verification time. So when it comes to snarks, I think one of the things that sometimes a little bit confusing, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the term snark, it, you know, it refers to this idea of something that's a succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. And then the term ZK snark also at the same time refers to like a very specific construction. Is, is that true? And if so, is that also the same thing for Starks? Is that is it also referring to a specific construction or is it a just a general term? So both the, te- the term uh, snark and ZK snark and the same thing with Stark and ZK Stark, these are general definitions that, that could cover potentially a very large variety of proof systems. But it is true that both of these terms have been sort of associated with, with very specific systems. So when people talk about snarks, they usually mean a very specific kind of a ZK snark that is used by Zcash. And I guess that when people talk about uh, snarks, they usually refer to the flavor of systems that that is based on IOPs and uh, uses things like, uh, I mean, the Fry protocol for low degree testing. So, So I guess this is inevitable that you have these general mathematical terms that then sort of get associated with very particular uh, proof systems. But that's, uh, you know, it is what it is. So could you uh, now walk us through a little bit of what are the trade-offs between, you know, the ZK snarks that are used in Zcash versus the Starks that you guys are working on versus some of the other family, such as like Bulletproofs? Yeah, sure. So let's uh, let's talk about these three things again: the the snarks of Zcash, the snarks that we're building, acknowledging that there are other kinds of snarks and snarks, and there will be other kinds. But let's just you know associate snarks with the stuff of Zcash, snarks with the stuff that, uh, that that we're building, and 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 there, there's bulletproofs. Snarks have uh, famously very short uh, proofs, like around two hundred bytes. Bulletproofs have longer proofs, around let's say two kilobytes or so. And uh, Starks have longer proofs, uh, around 20 kilobytes. So you go one order of magnitude increase moving from Starks to bulletproofs and then to Starks. In terms of uh, verification time, Starks and Starks are pretty similar. They're very, very fast. Uh, Starks are a little bit faster in verification, but, you know, 10 milliseconds in Starks versus, I don't know, 8 milliseconds or less in Starks. And then bulletproofs are or less so because uh, verification time in Bulletproof scales actually linearly with the amount of computation. Not uh, so, so Bulletproofs are not scalable according to our definition of the term. Uh, that's in terms of verification time. Proving time is fastest in Starks, then about one order of magnitude slower in uh, Snarks and Bulletproofs. And uh, I think the most important difference is in uh, sort of this other dimension of future-proofing the systems or what kind of assumptions you're using. So Starks require only uh, the existence of some collision-resistant hash function, which implies that they're plausibly post-quantum secure and uh, they require very lean cryptography. Bulletproofs require assumptions regarding the discrete log uh, over elliptic curve groups which is a slightly more exotic uh, problem, but it's been around for, I don't know, like two decades or so. And then snarks require things called knowledge of exponent, which are even more recent and slightly more exotic. So I guess that's sort of a comparison along the four dimensions of uh, proof length, 
proving time, verifying time, and uh, future-proofing the system. Okay, so just to summarize, in terms of proof size, there's a clear difference between bulletproof snarks and starks, sort of one order of magnitude for more than the previous for, for every system. Um, however, in the verification time where Starks have a much larger proof, uh, the verification time will be lower than Snarks and Bulletproofs. So we'll have faster verifications. And then in terms, uh, the real differentiating factor is that Starks is, relies upon cryptographic assumptions that have been around since the 70s. So these are collision-resistant um, hashes which means that they're a quantum resistant and very lean and presumably future proof because of this quantum resistant feature. Does that sum it up correctly? Yes, I think that's a good summary. And also uh, there's a fourth axis, which is the proving time, which is again fastest uh, with Starks. And we get the quantum resistance because there's no sort of like public key cryptography or pairings or anything like that, right? Quantum computers are, are known to be pretty good at solving problems related to hidden subgroups and, and you know factoring and discrete log and things like that. But they're not known to be able to break all cryptography. And in particular, there's a wide-held belief that most hash functions uh, will be secure against quantum, quantum computers, which is why uh, Starks are so. So if Starks relies on cryptographic assumptions that have existed since the 70s, why did it take so long for them to come into existence? Are there other things that needed to be invented before Starks could exist? Or did we just need you to figure it out? That's a good question. So, so a lot of the more practical cryptography in recent years has, has revolved around um, sort of... Uh, number theoretic assumptions and elliptic curves and so on. So, there, so there, there's this very wide class of researchers that are sort of somewhere between theory and practice that are very familiar, who are very familiar with uh, cryptography that uses uh, elliptic curves and, and uh, you know, RSA and other things. And the branch from which uh, Starks emerge from, which is known as computational complexity or the PCP theorem and things like that, has been you know, this uh, sort of uh, the playground mostly of uh, theoreticians and, and mathematicians and, and very few uh, practitioners or more practical-oriented researchers have ventured into it. Another factor was that um, some of the earlier constructions of uh, things like Starks were not as efficient, and, and you know, we needed to sort of... Uh, Tighten and and invent some some new stuff like you know the the Fry protocol, um, fast read Solomon IOPP and and the IOP model and uh, so the the IOP model is joint work with uh, Alessandro Chiesa and uh, Nick Spooner. The, the Fry protocol is is joint work with uh, Michael Riabtsev and um, Ido Bentov and Inon Hoesh. and then then we've done some some further improvements to the, Fry that, that also made things a bit tighter, like uh, Deep Fry that most recently uh, emerged, which is uh, joint work with uh, Leo Goldberg from Starkware and uh, two of our scientific advisors, uh, Swasti Koparti and Shubangi Saraf. So there's a little bit of advancement that needed to be done and some you know new mathematical stuff that needed to be invented. But there's it's I think it's also this cultural thing that the class of folks that that can build. Um, things like Starks uh, used to include a very small set of people and, and those that are more familiar with the techniques around uh, Snarks or Bulletproofs or other things is, is a wider set of uh, researchers. Okay, interesting. How should we think about some of the newer stuff that's coming out as well, especially within the IOP family, things like Aurora and stuff? There's a, a wide variety of systems that are uh, similar to Starks in, in requiring only the existence of a hash function. Uh, so Aurora is one, there's uh, Zikabu, Ligero, and then there's a uh, more recent, uh, I believe it's uh, Fractal and Marlin, that uh, at least one of them doesn't really require uh, 
you know, anything but for a collision resistant hash. And they're all very similar in some of their techniques, which uses basically um, interactive oracle proofs and uh, low degree testing algorithms. So they're similar. I mean, in particular, Aurora is not scalable because uh, its verifier scales linearly with the size of the input. It's more geared towards, uh, you know, circuits of unknown structure that, that the verifier must process, whereas Starks uh, have uh, scalable verification or uh, this exponential speed up. That's the main difference between uh, Aurora and Stark. Uh, there are other systems out there that are also similar, like... Uh, Ligero that, that has a uh, square root uh, proof length, it's verification time is actually, again, linear in the size of the computation, and, and there's others. Uh... So looking at this broad set of zero-knowledge systems that we've described, are there specific applications that are better suited for, say, Starks or Snarks or Bulletproofs? How do they distinguish each other in how they're implemented? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that, uh, so, so from my point of view, they're, they're, I think we're not that far from, from the optimum, at least with respect to Starks. And, and let me explain why. There are some uh, mathematically proven lower bounds that we're not that far off from. So for instance, if your computation scaling parameters, let's use T for that parameter. So as T goes to infinity, we know that verifier time must increase at least like the logarithm of t and uh we know that the prover time must scale at least like t now the stars that we have right now prover time scales almost linearly in t there's really like one uh fast Fourier transform there and improving and the fast Fourier transform costs uh, t times logarithm of t and improving on the fft is this long-standing open problem in all of uh you know, math and, and algorithms. So, so I think it's very safe to assume that, that, you know, it would require a very major breakthrough in order to do something that's better than T log T. That's my belief. Then um, in terms of verification time, again, Starks already have log of T to very small power. So you could reduce that power a little bit, but you're very close to theoretical limits. And in terms of cryptographic assumptions, again, there's, I'm not aware of many assumptions that are uh, weaker than assuming uh, the existence of a collision-resistant hash. So along almost any of the parameters that you look at, there's just very little, you know, fat that you can hope to uh, trim in, in the future. So, I mean, that's part of the reason that we are so uh, optimistic about, you know, the use of, of Starks. But that, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, when you get close to theoretical limits, you know that you're pretty uh, safe, I would say. Recently, Starkware announced two products or initiatives that uh, they were working on, StarkDex and StarkPay. Both of these make use of what we call ZK rollups, which we'll get to in a little bit. Can you talk about how these two products fit into the broader mission of Starkware? Yes. So there's this um, principle of, of blockchains that, that uh, I like to call inclusive accountability, which means that uh, everyone using their laptop is invited to sort of monitor the health of all of the system and verify everything that's going on. But once you impose this principle of inclusive accountability on a financial system like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, then two things uh, get compromised. First one is privacy because everyone verifies everything. And the second one is scalability because if you want to grow your system 10x, then you need everyone who wants to uh, monitor the system to sort of go and buy 10 laptops instead of one or increase their bandwidth uh, 10x, which is unrealistic. And if you do that, you'll be sort of throwing out a whole lot of uh, folks from uh, monitoring the health of the system. So what you really want to do, and this is where something like Starks come in, is you would like to use the scalability aspect and have uh, one entity generate the proof for ever-increasing batches and use this uh, magical aspect of, of, of Starks where uh, 
verification time scales exponentially smaller than batch size in order to maintain inclusive accountability. Still, everyone can check everything and make sure that the system is okay. But you don't need uh, to replace your laptop uh, every time the system goes up uh, 10x. Now, we started asking ourselves, where can we uh, deploy this functionality, this scalability in the best way? And uh, we looked around a little bit, and it seemed to us that the most, uh, the simplest and fastest way to address a real problem seen by the world today is in the area of uh, basically transacting, that's uh, payments, and also trading, because currently, due to the low throughput of uh, blockchains, essentially, if you want to use them either as payment systems or you want to trade them uh, using the principles of inclusive accountability and, uh, you know, trust no one, so on and so forth, you can't really do that. So you have a wide variety of players, you know, the custodial exchanges that tell you, okay, you know what, send your Bitcoins or Ether here, park them with us, we'll maintain the keys, and, and then, you know, you'll do all your trading on our books. And uh, similar things happen with payment providers where basically they sort of tell you, you know, leave your payments with us. At the end of the month, we'll sort of, you know, check out all the books and send one big payment to the uh, various uh, merchants and so on. And we thought it would be really good to use Starks to show the world how you can maintain inclusive accountability, not need to trust or hand over custody of your funds, your payments at any point, and still scale the system even within its existing parameters without waiting for you know, Plasma or Ethereum 2.0. On the existing Ethereum, we can already you know, batch settle and batch uh, pay tens of thousands of, uh, of transactions, which is, uh, you know, two to three order of magnitudes more than Ethereum can do uh, natively. So that's how we got to this line of products. That's, that's really cool. And um, I was really excited to hear about this at, at Starkware Sessions when you first um, talked about it publicly. How do you arrive at this, this scalability of tens of thousands of transactions per block in Ethereum, and how are you making use of, of Starks to do that? Ah, that's a great question, uh, Sebastian. So remember that uh, the S in the Stark stands for scalability, which means that as T, where T is now the number of trades that you're settling, as T goes to infinity, proving time, which is done you know, on the cloud or on some huge server, scales almost linearly with T. So you can reach very large batch sizes. At the same time, verifying a batch of T trades does not take, uh, uh, you know, does not scale linearly in T. It scales actually like the logarithm of T, which means that each time you go 10x on, on the number of transactions you want to settle, you're only, you know, doing plus one on the amount of gas that you're paying on the chain. So uh, using this kind of, uh, you know, Math allows you to take, for instance, a batch of 32,000 trades, generate a single proof that they settled correctly, and that single proof can be verified within the gas limit of a single Ethereum block. So this gives you an amortized gas cost of around 200 gas per trade that is settled. So you are using the scalability, the exponential speed up in verification, in order to exponentially reduce the gas cost of settlements. And why did you choose to focus on scalability rather than privacy, for instance, which is what I think most people associate to zero knowledge systems? So back in the day when we thought about uh, which of the two aspects of uh, Starks should we pursue first? Is it privacy or scalability? Our thinking was something along these lines. Okay, there are a lot of technologies that for the single shielded transaction are pretty good. You have the Snarks of Zcash. You had already back then Bulletproofs, which again for a single shielded transaction works pretty well and a bunch of other technologies. But there was this huge need in scalability solutions. I mean, there still is. And there was no real technological 
alternative to the efficiency of Starks in this respect. And I, I think there still isn't. This goes back to your question about, you know, how far are we from, you know, the optimal proof system? So even today with all these newest systems, if you look uh, head to head at huge batches of computations, uh, Starks still outperform all of them. And I, I think this, uh, you know, it's, it's likely to continue in this way. So it was very clear to us that scalability uh, is uh, an area where this technology can be applied to very, uh, in a very unique way. And it's a very big need. So that's why we addressed it first. We will add privacy, have no doubt, but uh, I think it will come later. So one thing that's happening here is in this model, you're batching within a block, but it's still, so you, you, you amortize only what's going on in a single block. We can compare this to things like Coda, for example, or like things that make use of recursive snarks where not only do you amortize the computation within a block, but you amortize the computation over the entire system. Would it be possible to recurse the Starks? Because then if so, you only really have to publish the proof onto Ethereum, uh, the data, but you don't actually have to run the verifier on Ethereum until someone actually wants to exit. So would that be possible to be done with the Starks? So whenever you have a proof system in which verification scales uh, sublinearly with uh, computation size, you can uh, compose it uh, re incrementally. So this, w this notion was first described in this beautiful paper in, uh, by Paul Valiant, and it's called incrementally verifiable computation. So whenever you have a proof system in which the verifier running time scales sublinearly with the computation size, you can use it for chopping up a computation into steps and doing them one after the other and proving that you ran a verifier that ran a verifier that so on and so forth. So you could do that with Starks as well, uh, you know, uh, quite efficiently. Whether for a given problem, this is your best line of attack, I'm, I'm skeptical. I think that for most applications, you're better off just using a Stark, it will be more efficient, or you might want to use uh, limited recursion uh, Starks, let's say, you know, one level of recursion, which means you prove that you checked a bunch of proofs. That's where you end. Not that you checked proofs, that checked proof, that checked proof, and so on and so forth. So just to summarize, you can do a recursive Stark. I think that practically for most uh problems that you'll face, you are better off not using it, even though you can. Let's say in the Stark decks, let's say users only exit their coins once every hundred blocks, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. it, then if we use the recursive Stark, instead of having to run a verifier every single block, we can only have to run the verifier once every really only we only need to verify the state to prove the state to ethereum when someone is actually trying to exit so how many blocks for example would that have to be that it makes it worth it to use the recursive system i don't know but like uh you could still uh if you want to prove that you checked a uh, 100 proofs sequentially it would still only be one level of recursion your statement would be, I saw a sequence of 100 proofs one after the other. This is not 100 levels of recursion. 100 levels of recursion would be, I want with each block to verify, you know, that the verifier run by the previous block, which checked the verifier run by the previous block, and so on and so forth, ad infinitum, that this thing worked. And that's a very different construction that is also... You know, it's uh, security analysis is sort of much more uh, tricky to do. And uh, if you really want to do it the right way, then, you know, various parameters blow up very quickly. So even for the uh, use case that you're giving, which is a very practical one, you're probably better off with just having uh, one level of recursion. You know, every 100 blocks, you have a verifier proving to you that it saw a sequence of 100 proofs and it checked all of them. This is still one level of recursion. 
And you could have, you know, one for every hundred blocks, and you could, then you could have a daily proof for the, all blocks of a day, all blocks of a week, and so on and so forth. So this is an example of, of a use case that I think you're better off using just one level of recursion rather than the notion of infinite recursion. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And so would it be possible to sort of like compose these like things together? So let's say, you know, it's 150 blocks. We can take one of 100 and then one of 50 and we can put these together. But essentially what I'm trying to think through here is, is there a way to offload the verification gas cost onto the users, the user who wants to exit rather than on the people who are submitting the proofs? Well, the way it works right now is that the gas cost is not on the provers. The provers are working very hard to generate the proof, but the gas cost is is sort of... Uh... Oh, sorry, you're right. The prover is submitting the proof and is paying with gas to this sort of network to sort of uh, check this thing. I think that if you don't have any proof out there for a while, then you're risking all kinds of attacks, right? How do you know that the system is actually evolving correctly uh, until someone 100 blocks later comes and says, oh, I need to, you know, take my money out. Maybe by then someone ran off with it and, you know, no proofs were provided. So, so I'm not sure. I think you still need proofs pretty frequently. I believe that uh, from what you guys wrote up, it's that you're including, for the, to solve data availability, you're still pushing the data onto Ethereum of all the trade data. And so couldn't this proof data also be pushed on in the same way that the rest of the data availability is done, but just not actually run the verifier? Yeah, you could do that. But again, I think you're risking... Uh, so if the main network doesn't really you know, see or check the proof, then someone could uh, start uh, deviating from or just not putting proofs as they should. And now I think you're sort of going away from this notion of maintaining at all times a system that, that is, uh, has integrity to one that requires something like a watchtower or fraud proofs or something, just uh, right until you reach that, that checkpoint uh, 100 blocks later. This Stark Dex demonstration that you've built, I believe it's live on Ethereum mainnet. Is that correct? No, it's not. It was uh, just a demo that was run for some time on, on Ropsten testnet. Okay. What's the barrier to running this on mainnet? And are there further optimizations that you could make in order for it to be even more scalable? Yeah. So, I mean, to run it on mainnet, uh, first of all, you have to sort of run a whole bunch of audits and then add a lot of functionality. For instance, it was only in the maker-taker model and basically... Sorry, if you want to put it on mainnet, you want to add other kinds of order types, limit orders, uh, you know, partial fulfillments, uh, cancellations, whatnot. You also needed to be integrated. So this was sort of a settlement engine that, that has to be integrated with some exchange. So you would need to integrate it with, with some relayer uh, if it was to be over 0x or over some other protocol. So there was a lot of work that still needed to be done and could still be done if we, you know, if uh, relayers come up and... Uh, uh, want to work with us. And uh, definitely you can improve uh, the functionality of it. And that's precisely what uh, our team has been doing pretty impressively uh, since the launch of that that thing. So now we have a system with far greater functionality and scale than what appears in that uh, demo alpha. Are there any improvements that could be made if there were any pre-compiles that you were allowed to add? Yeah, I mean, you would lower the gas cost. Basically, that's what would happen. But we found ways to uh, make everything work within the existing uh, Ethereum system and without asking for any pre-compile. So we can work uh, pretty efficiently even over the existing Ethereum. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're very proud and happy with that. That's another aspect of the efficiency of uh, Starks. I mean, if you compare this to what happened with uh, Snarks, for instance, so so you know, without the precompiles, they you, you couldn't really run them uh, nearly at all on on uh, Ethereum. So that's why Ethereum went ahead and added some precompiles. But with uh, Starks, uh, they're already efficient enough uh, without any changes to uh, Ethereum. 
So based on those numbers that you mentioned earlier, it's like how many transactions per second we could get with 8 million gas. The So the limiting factor is no longer the gas limit for the verifier. The limiting factor is now the proving time for the prover. The gas limit per block is still a limiting uh, aspect, but we can uh, sort of still put a lot of proofs out there. So we reached uh, 32,000 trades that we can send, settle in a single block. Maybe you could, we could push it also to 64K. Uh, I should say with the uh, uh, once uh, Istanbul turns on with uh, EAP 2028 that uh, we're very proud to have helped uh, to push forward, then the only factor that will limit us is, is exactly what you said. It's uh, the amount of compute that we can uh, generate uh, uh, off-chain, but practically almost... Uh, you know, I can't even compute what the limit will be, but it will probably be in the many, many millions, if not uh, maybe billions of trades. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you. So let's let's move on to Starkware, the company, because you know you guys have built these these demonstrations, Stark Dex, and there's another initiative that came out recently called Stark Pay, which we didn't even have a chance to talk about. Um, but what is the goal of Starkware, the company, and what problems is it trying to solve? and for which types of customers? So our long-term vision is to um, help uh, Stark Technology become prevalent and used as uh, infrastructure in a whole variety of blockchain uses and then also in uses outside of blockchains, just in the standard world. But, you know, we're <laughs> we only have 32 engine, uh, you know, folks right now and we need to move uh, cautiously one thing at a time. So our first product is, uh, and I want to emphasize something here, is not a DEX. So we are not currently building a DEX. We are building scalability solutions for standard uh, exchanges, you know, the kinds that are known as centralized exchanges. So just a week ago, um, our team announced uh, at DevCon 5 that uh, by early 2020, we'll be launching the Stark Exchange engine, which is not a DEX, and it will be serving uh, Diversify, which again is not a DEX itself. It is a uh, you know an exchange that is sort of uh, you know operates like Bitfinex or Ethfinex um, with similar liquidity pools, but against which you trade without ever handing custody over your assets to the uh, exchange operator. That's the big difference. So very similar to like the ZeroX model. Very similar in the sense that that uh, you do not transfer uh, custody over your assets to anyone while you're trading. But in other ways, it's very different. I think ZeroX is this basic protocol that that is used as a you know a layer that that others are supposed to build on, whereas we are building a service that will be serving a particular customer in this case. Uh, diversify, even though we would very much like to offer this uh, service of, of generating proofs to other exchanges as well. So it's a different uh, business model and different sort of uh, system that, that we're building. But it is similar in, in allowing self-custodial trading. And so I believe you used the term prover as a service a little bit earlier in the conversation to describe part of what Starkware does. What is a prover as a service and why is that useful? Starkware is a for-profit company. Famously, we have not done an ICO. We do not have a coin. So uh, we're sort of uh, bound by the uh, <laughs> laws of uh, physics or of uh, economics and business. We have to sort of find ways to generate profits and then sustain ourselves and main you know you know remain can't just be burning our money and uh, so we need to think about uh, uh, business models that that make sense while we're advancing this technology and infrastructure and um, the notion of prover as a service is a very natural one uh, just like uh, you have software as a service and other service providers you know it's this thing that as long as you're using you're sort of uh, paying it but if you know you could turn it off whenever you want 
So our model currently, the one that we're using first, is, is uh, Prover as a service. So the exchanges and, and various uh, companies that will be working with us will be uh, uh, some one way or another renting or paying for these services. And uh, it's, it makes a lot of uh, economic sense on both sides. Would you be licensing out the Prover software or would you be actually running the proofs yourself? So in the... Um, Prover as a service model, you don't license it out. You run the servers and, you know, basically you get, for instance, uh, we'll be getting batches of settlements from Diversify and then generating a proof for that batch and sending it to the uh, verifier contract on the main chain. That's the current model. But uh, I want to emphasize that it's not the only one that we're considering. And definitely down the line, things like uh, uh, licensing or freemium and maybe, you know, in three to five years, maybe selling hardware or other things like that are all uh, uh, viable options that you know we'll be exploring. So, hearing this, it sounds that it sounds like you will have some service running on a server, and that service will be receiving transactions from an exchange, and then you'll be generating a proof and sending that to the Ethereum chain or whatever whatever blockchain is is being used. I suppose to the uninformed ear, that would sound like you guys are essentially centralizing that service. Talk about the liveness issues that this could cause and how are you ensuring that exchanges don't have to rely you know, solely on you being available? How do you reduce that dependency? So the first answer is that uh, just like other service providers, we actually expect and you know, embrace and welcome competition, which means, you know, just like if you're looking at your cloud provider, you, you don't need to... Uh, you can't be censored by, let's say, Amazon. You can just move it to, you know, Google Cloud or something like that. So uh, over time, we're sure that there'll be other prover as a service uh, competitors out there, which is one answer. Another answer is that, uh, you know, till then, and even when that happens, um, it's very important to allow customers and the end users to be able to. Uh, control and get their funds, even in catastrophic events where, let's say, Starcore is hacked and, and the exchange itself is hacked. So just to emphasize, in both these cases, uh, no one, I mean, if you hack into Starcore, you can't really take uh, the user's funds because they are being traded self-custodially, so only the users can uh, do that. But someone can hack uh, Starcore and, and try to shut down its service in order to... Uh, you know, prevent anything from happening. So we've built a, a bunch of uh, sort of the emergency hatches uh, that you could, uh, I mean, that are automatically invoked when when folks want to take their funds out of the system and, and it just doesn't service them. And in order to th do that, we will be, uh, you know, launching a variety of uh, data availability solutions that will ensure that users have uh, redundancy in their access to the information they need to, in order to extract their funds if Starkware or the exchange is ever uh, catastrophically hacked. Cool. So is there anything you want to share that you know, is coming soon to Starkware? Uh, you know, what's, what's on the roadmap and where can people find you and get involved? Yeah, so uh, we, we're talking to a whole lot of uh, exchanges and custodians and, and traders and uh, services around exchanges and in this area because we want to, first of all, uh, serve as many exchanges as are willing to use this technology. And second, we would like to ensure that uh, traders and, and uh, users have a seamless experience when they're using our technology. And we'd like it to be of use to anyone who offers uh, services to end users, be it a custodian service or an OTC desk or uh, a trading firm and so on and so forth, a broker. So we're, we're holding a lot of discussions and, and uh, we see a lot of uh, enthusiasm for integrating with this technology. So MetaMask uh, announced that you know we were the first uh, team to use their new API in order to allow traders to use uh, or trade on uh, our systems using uh, uh, MetaMask. And we're uh, currently integrating uh, our technology into Ledger so that, again, traders can sort of uh, seamlessly use it. 
and we're, I expect we'll be announcing a whole lot of other collaborations and integration projects so that everyone can use this thing. At the same time, we're also talking to a lot of uh, exchanges, you know, big ones and small ones, and, and I think we'll see a few others uh, joining uh, Diversify in, in this uh, move to uh, a larger liquidity pool for trading uh, in a self-custodial way. And this is very important for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's uh, safer for traders, which is good for uh, business. It's also good for the exchanges. You know, the insurance cost and security overhead is much lower. Another thing is that you can sort of move in and out of your positions across exchanges much more seamlessly. And that's very important for, uh, again, streamlining and uh, uh, making uh, the blockchain ecosystem a bit more like the traditional one. And, and lastly, there's a lot of uh, fragmentation of liquidity between different exchanges due to a variety of reasons, you know, uh, geofencing and uh, uh, geographic locations and regulatory stuff and technological differences. And uh, we believe that our technology can enable, you know, a defragmentation process of this uh, liquidity pool and uh, a lot more uh, market efficiency, which is uh, why I think the folks we're talking to are also very enthusiastic about this. Cool. Well, Ellie, I want to thank you uh, once again for coming on the show and for being so gracious with your time. I know you're on vacation. So uh, I want to thank you again and I look forward to having you again in the future. Maybe not in four years, but uh, at some point. <laughs> thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Sonny. This is, as usual, a very delightful experience. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>